Hey everyone, welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. In the Mobile User Acquisition Show, we talk about how to use mobile user acquisition strategies to grow your app quickly and capital efficiently. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is presented by me, Shamant Rao, mobile growth leader and founder and CEO of the mobile growth consulting firm, Rocketship HQ. Each episode includes strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition that you can use to unlock tremendous growth for your app in a sustainable and capital efficient manner. Our guest today is Sandra Wu, paid content marketer at Blinkist. In today's interview, Sandra dispels many of the misconceptions about these marketing channels starting from suggesting an entirely different approach to these ads and understanding the place that they occupy in a funnel to selecting the right metrics to measure success and critically evaluating if paid content marketing is indeed the right user flow for an app, she covers all bases. In today's conversation, Sandra highlights the very many differences between Facebook and Google advertising and paid content marketing with many relatable examples and sharp insights that I'm thrilled to present today. I'm very excited to welcome Sandra Wu to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Sandra, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sherman. How are you? I'm great and I'm thrilled to have you because certainly we've been talking about this for a while uh, and uh, I'm thrilled and excited we got you on the show today. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. Certainly you are, uh, I'm also thrilled to have you because you are certainly among the leading experts on paid content in the world today. Certainly you manage very substantial scale and driven very significant results from paid content, uh, which is what we're going to dive into today. Mm -hmm. So at a very high level, right? So how is paid content different from, let's just say Facebook or Google ads? And how does that change a marketer's strategy? Um, yeah, so I think uh, a lot of people tend to think of paid content as different from Facebook and Google. Um, but in fact, it's just a, it's a unique flow. So it's a flow that redirects to a piece of content before the app store. So you can also use this on Facebook and Google. Um, and it just means like these ads, instead of taking you directly to the app store, like a lot of my mobile app install ads, uh, you, it would take you to a landing page or an article first where uh, you will get a little bit more information about the app before going to like uh, the App Store or Google Play. Um, but I think the reason why people think it's different from Facebook and Google is that uh, this, this flow is traditionally more associated with Outbrain and Taboola. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with these channels, uh, they're basically native advertising channels who offer inventory on news websites. And they control this ad space underneath most articles you will read online. So just to give you an example, if you visit like the Guardian uh, and at the end of the article, there will be a section that says uh, you may like or from around the world that is owned by mostly Outbrain and Taboola. Um, and the reason why uh, you, would, you would choose the, the paid content flow with them is because it offers you um, an opportunity to capture people while they're in this reading mode. So it's actually a perfectly match with the, the content flow. And that's why it's more popular there. Um, but even like nowadays, I think uh, an app install campaign is just as popular on Outbrain and Taboola. So it's, it, it's basically, it started off with Outbrain and Taboola, but uh, now this flow is being used on uh, like quite a few channels now. Um, and your other question about how does this change a marketer's strategy? Um, so I would say like right now, especially in the, in the past few weeks, uh, there's been a lot of concern about, uh, the iOS 14 release and a lot of apps are, are like, they're basically rushing to find like a workflow so they don't have to rely so much on the app store. Um, and I think this is where, where this comes in, like the app, the marketers that decided to, uh, to make a content flow work, um, before now, they would have an advantage because then they don't rely completely on this app store flow and they have something to fall back on. 
And I think um, a lot of other marketers are starting to learn this and, and they do want to make a, like a content flow or a web flow work for them. So this is how it really fits into the strategy nowadays. Sure. So it sounds like why, the way this is so significant is because people are already reading, right? If they're on a news website, they're already reading, you're giving them something more to read. So there's a very fairly seamless transition. And then you're like, oh, there's a call to action. And therefore they convert. And that, it sounds like that's why it can be so powerful uh, as a user flow. Right. Yeah, exactly. But I think it could also be the case, like if someone is browsing their, their feed on Facebook and they're interested in discovering content, uh, this also fits very nicely. Right, right, yeah. right. So it isn't, it isn't specific to certain platforms, but it could certainly be leveraged within Facebook ads just as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and certainly with a paid content ad, there are different components. There's a headline, there's an image, and there's a landing page as a part of the flow. Uh, and my understanding is that the headline on a paid content ad is significantly more important than let's just say the ad copy on Facebook, uh, where the ad copy is almost peripheral to the image of the video. Whereas my understanding is that with a paid content ad, the headline is so critical. Can you speak to why this is the case? Yeah, sure. Um... Well, so I think on Facebook, um, it, like it's just it's a completely different animal. Uh, you couldn't really apply the same learnings from Facebook onto uh, paid content. But um, for example, like my experience, I feel like you can get away with having the same ad copy for a while, as long as you refresh the video or like the carousel ad or whatever you have attached to the creative. And I think that these ads are a lot flashier. Um, and I think the copy is really only a part of the experience. Uh, whereas with, like you said, with the paid content ads, where it's just an image and a headline, um, it's so simple and people actually behave with it differently. So, um, for example, I think there was a study that was done by Tabula where they tried to analyze how people engage with these ads. And um, this, this ad actually in itself is a funnel. So uh, the image serves to attract people's attention. And uh, when people... Uh, have their eyes on this ad, then they look at the headline. So the headline is really the first touch point. Um, and actually this, uh, I'll address one thing, like a lot of people ask me, it's like, you gotta make sure the image matches with the headline. It's actually completely not necessary at all because um, those people who are actually looking at these ads, they don't perceive it as one item. Uh, it's just, it comes right afterwards, like the image attracts and leaves almost no impression whatsoever uh, on, the, on the person and then, then they look at the headline and that's basically where they, that would be like the first, as I said, like impression they get of the product. And that sets the expectation about what's gonna happen after that and how likely they will convert after looking at this headline. Um, yeah, so like maybe maybe I can give you an example. Um, I think like I like examples. Um, so let's assume that you have like a weight loss app. Um, and there's an there's a content ad of uh, maybe like a woman running, and it attracts your attention. And you you uh, you decide to look at the ad, and it could have one of two headlines. And these options are the, the first one being this app teaches you how to lose weight in 30 days, and the second one is five tips on how to lose weight in in 30 days. Uh, which one do you think would have a, a better ROI? What for me to say? They both look very similar visually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. What's the answer? <laughs> I well, so, yeah. Um, so I think, okay, like the difference between two, like the, the app teach, this app teaches you how to lose weight in 30 days. Uh, it's a lot more niche for sure. Like there's probably not as many people interested in clicking this than five tips on how to lose weight in 30 days because the latter, you know, anyone could click. Um, anyone will want to know these five tips, and but not everyone will be interested in an app. Um, but it, this already sets, uh, sets an expectation here. Uh, if you were to go with the five tips on how to lose weight in 30 days, um, it sets the expectation that the person clicking, like they're, they're there to figure out what these five tips are. They're not there to check out your app. So even if your, your app is like a tip number two, for example, they're not like they're clicking with the intention of just reading up on, on quick tips that would help them. They're not going to be interested in actually converting later on. Um, so like 
even then, like even if the CTR is like three times higher on a, a headline like this, um, the conversion rate wouldn't be that great because people have complete like different intentions to what you want. Uh, whereas with a headline like this app teaches you how to lose weight in 30 days, the people clicking are probably interested in this kind of app or they're, they're interested enough that they want to know, okay, like this person is trying to sell something to me, but I'm intrigued enough because I want to lose weight in 30 days. So they're a lot more qualified. And because you're paying by CPC, so it, like with, or actually it depends on the, the platform, of course, but like with Albert and, and Tabula, you pay by a click. You don't want everyone clicking on your ad. You just want qualified traffic. Um, yeah, and so like this is the concept of basically targeting through creatives. Um, so you're not just relying on lookalike audiences to find the most qualified traffic. You're relying on actually just setting better expectations with people. Um, right. And you do that through copy. Right, right. And I really like that like how you're qualifying the right users via the copy itself, right? And uh, that can be so critical. And it's not something that a lot of marketers really think to, but that can be so critical. Just a moment, I will move to a different place because I know there's some background sound there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I think the, the thing is like in the, this day and age, um, a lot of marketers have become so analytical no, hang that- on, hang on. Uh, can we, yeah. can you go now? Oh, sorry. I oh, yeah. was walking, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, there was some um, background noise in case you did that. Yeah. So I no worries. No worries. Place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I completely agree with you. I think marketers nowadays rely so much on, um, you know, these like fancy targeting options uh, or uh, analyzing assets uh, and tweaking things here and there to make sure that they have the most qualified audience. Uh, whereas I think they will probably get a, a like, bigger impact by evaluating whether or not their message uh, attracted the right people rather than um, playing around with different assets. Yeah. And, oh God, sorry. Is that too loud? I'm so sorry. I don't hear anything actually. Hear anything? Okay. No. There seems to be some repair going on outside. Okay. What I was getting away from. I hope they finish in a moment. If you don't hear anything, hopefully it's, uh, it's fine. Let me just see if the other rooms much better. What's that going on outside, huh? Oh, kind of change the building. Oh God. Is this room gonna be better? The only thing I can think of is going on the roof. Roof? I won't have Wi-Fi on the roof. Yeah, no, let me use this room. Let me try this room. Sorry, this is our closet room. Mm -hmm. okay. this, uh, better. Yeah, sorry about that. So let's just start that uh, part again. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Which part? The part about what I, what I just said now? So let me, let me say, and then you can reflect that. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, what I do like about what you said is how you're intentional about qualifying users by language, right? which is not something a lot of marketers uh, think very intentionally about. And I really like how you express that. Yeah, I think, um, well, that's actually the essence of marketing, right? But I, I think lately, like with, uh, with uh, online marketing, especially, um, I think people become a little bit more concerned about like analyzing their numbers, excluding certain assets um, and just making these like special tweaks. Uh, and they don't really quite think about maybe they should just evaluate their messaging from the very beginning to make sure they don't attract unqualified audiences. Yeah. And with, when it comes to picking a headline, uh, you gave a great example about what would work well, what wouldn't what would you say are some of the key elements or considerations in selecting a headline? Um, so it, actually it's not, I mean, because the, the, the funnel is longer and there's like an article or a landing page behind it, it's not really as simple as like how to pick the right headline. Um, I think the most important thing is that you gotta make sure you have a good article or a landing page to begin with. Um, and the way to do that is just like, I would say choose an interesting idea that you can write like 800 words about that would 
do a good job by selling your app. Um, so things that wouldn't work is if you uh, have like article headlines or like a like a landing page headline that sounds like an, a, a plain ad, it just doesn't do well because it like people don't actually benefit from the, having that extra step in the funnel, and in the end, it only hurts you. Um, yeah, so I would say like just come up with like a really good value proposition that you can write uh, a, a lot of like a lot of content around. I think that would be a good way to go in just choosing an angle. Um, but it, when it comes to like actually just like narrowing down a good headline, I would say try to mirror the style of the top publisher that you think you'll be advertising on. Um, and I think you can get this information like on on Outbrain or Taboola's website. You can see what kind of publishers there are, or you can even just get in touch with them and say like, "Hey, I'm interested. Um, I'm interested in like, specifically this market. Can you tell me what your portfolio looks like in that market?" And then do some research from there. So I'll give you an example. If I'm advertising in the U.S. on Outbrain, I know that CNN is going to be my top spender. So I will keep the language a little bit more journalistic. But if I'm advertising in the U.K. Um, and let's say like I'm, I'm working with Taboola, I know that most of their inventory is like tabloid news. Um, so I, could, I think the language can be a little bit more casual or like even like with Business Insider, I can keep the language a little bit more casual. So I think, um, yeah, like the first thing, first, first most important thing is make sure you have a good idea. Uh, there's no point in tweaking your headline or adding, um, I don't know, buzzwords or like uh, clickbait um, expressions if you don't have a good article. But once you do have that, then just, uh, do your research and figure out where your ad's going to appear and try to um, try to simulate this kind of language. Yeah, so in some ways you're being native to where the ads are shown. Actually, if you're on CNN, you want to make sure the ads are, some ad language mirrors what the surroundings where it's seen. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and you know, with headlines, you, you know, you could potentially get very clickbaity, you know, you could say something like, you'll never believe this happened and whatnot. And, and that's probably an exaggeration, but you know, you could certainly write a headline with the sole benefit of eliciting clicks. So in your experience, how well do clickbait uh, headlines work? Uh, I, yeah, it's so funny because a lot of people think this is uh, a huge part of pay content marketing. Yeah. Um, and I like, fair enough, because like, if you were to look at these ads, like some of the headlines, like, um, you you wouldn't believe how Daniel Radcliffe looks like now, or you know, like these kind of headlines where you're just like, well, I'm so curious what's on the next page, and you, you want to click on it. But uh, the, actually, I don't do that, uh, and like not anymore. So I, I tried this kind of strategy at the very beginning of my career um, when I, I when I started doing this. Actually, I was thinking, oh wow, like I've been hired to write clickbait articles, um, I, like, and I was like so curious how this will work, but. Uh, I remember when I first tested it, like, and it only went on for like maybe a week where I was trying these kind of titles and I realized that uh, the CTR was really good, but the quality of the traffic was really poor. And I mentioned before that you pay per click on Outbrain and Taboola. So there's really no need for you to click because you had actually, it ended up costing you quite a lot. Um, yeah. You actually just want qualified traffic. So you don't want it like the, like, let's say like you're, for example, if you're targeting like middle-aged people with your app, you don't want the 18 year olds or like 16 year olds uh, who spend like ages online clicking on your headline just because you added, you won't believe what yeah. reason number two is, you know? Yeah. Um, but one thing I do do is that I try to add sensationalism to my headlines. It's not clickbaiting uh, or maybe like it, it's, it, I guess like some people can confuse it too, but like I use a lot of buzzwords. Um, mm -hmm. And I find that this is actually a pretty good way of like uh, increasing the CTR while having qualified audiences. So, uh, for example, let's say like um, if someone wants to write a write a headline that says "Moms like this app." Um, I wouldn't write it like that. I think naturally, like because I've been in this industry for so long, I will never settle with such a plain headline. Uh, I will probably like like just rewrite that as like "Moms are praising this ingenious app" or something like that. Uh, it, like it seems very buzzwordy and it, like I think some people could even call it clickbaiting but uh, this this way of like just dressing up a headline is actually pretty good at raising the CTR um, yeah. and it wouldn't cost you later on. Yeah so you're still increasing your CTR but you're not getting random unqualified traffic which you would if you went very clickbaity. Yeah. 
right? And it sounds like you're still, you know, like you said earlier, you don't want people who are just looking for five tips. You want people who can actually buy a subscription in the app for actually the right fit. And I really like how you characterized the distinction here uh, between clickbaity and the ones that's relatively more plain, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the flow itself, user flow, uh, you could have a paid content headline or an ad that takes users directly to the app store, or you could take them to the landing page, which is what you've been describing for most part, right? So, is the so when do you recommend that an app look at a direct to app store flow and when do you recommend that they look at a uh, flow to a landing page um so i, I think uh, like uh, recently i see like a lot of apps going for the app store flow um because it is much easier to get right you don't have to hire like uh, writers to actually write articles for you or designers to design a landing page for you um and also, I think like I do see quite a lot of gaming apps going for this option. Um, I think it really just comes down to the unique selling point of your app. So let's say like, and I, like I mentioned before, like you no, know, like you gotta see, you gotta like come up with a piece of content that will benefit from having that extra set, set of the funnel. And if an app is like plain and simple, um, and it's free, which which is the same with like a lot of gaming apps. Uh, or if it competes on pricing, uh, then you just want to send them to the app store as fast as you can. You don't want to uh, have an extra step to funnel where you will lose people. Um, so like, like app store flow makes so much more sense if that's your app. But if your app is, let's say, relatively high end, um, and let's say like it requires a bit of a, a, an explanation, like for example, with Blinkist, um, we were like the first of its kind, really. And in the beginning, it was just so hard to explain what we do in one sentence or like just like, you know, 300 characters really, uh, that actually having this extra article or extra landing page um, actually made a lot of sense. It, it, like, it really got the buy-in from uh, the users. So in that case, you want to go with the, the content flow. Uh, and the same with like really pricey apps. Like, let's say like there are some apps out there um, uh, where it's like they would charge maybe like 100 euros per month um then they really should have an extra um landing page or article that explains why uh, people should should pay that much money uh, to use their app every month yeah yeah and it sounds like if this is an easy sell they probably don't need to go to a landing page but if a user needs more education then the landing page makes more sense exactly and I'll, but like, i think the the key thing here is like, is it free or not because uh, I've talked to quite a few uh, advertisers where they're just like, damn, like Algorand and Taboola just doesn't work for us. And then, and then they say like, okay, our app is free. And we, our, our benchmark is just cost per install. And I'm thinking, yeah, you should not have tried this flow. If you're the only thing you're looking at is cost per install, this will not benefit you. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, and with the landing page or the article, how do you think about what content should be there or what selling points should be there or how it needs to be structured? Um, well, so I think it's not rocket science and it also comes down to like setting expectations. Um, so it depends on, it depends on what headline you decided to go with in the beginning. Um, let's say you decided, okay, I'm going to, okay, let, let's say we have an example of um, a food delivery app. And you decided that, okay, I'm going to, like my first test is going to be an ad where it says like Americans are loving this food delivery app. Then you can probably be a little bit salesy in the content um, because people are genuinely curious about your app. But if you wanted to go with a headline where it's just like, oh, I'm not, let's say like, for example, your, your PR team tells you like, oh, I don't really feel comfortable with like being that tacky. Can we go with something that's a little bit more PR like, like, um, I don't know, a headline like food delivery app reveals what Americans eat. Uh, if that's the case, then you got you to gotta focus on giving people that insight first before you go on forever talking about your app. Um, so it's really just about setting expectations. Uh, and, and it's not rocket science. I think if, you're, if, if you read the news enough, then you'll know how some of these articles look like. 
Um, and if you, for example, if you wanted to do a five tips article, then you probably have read um, a lot of articles like this in the past, yeah. and then you just mirror yeah. what that looks like. So it, it, it minimizes like the, the gap in expectations. Yeah, yeah. And which makes me also wonder, you know, you could be, you could be very salesy or at least pitch your product very clearly and obviously, or you could be more educational, like five tips and whatnot. Do you know, you know, and in fact, I can think of some marketers who would say, oh, we don't want to be too salesy, too pitchy. Do you think that's a good idea? Um, well, so I think either could work. Okay. Um, I personally don't like to be overly salesy, okay. but I also do, I don't like this approach where um, you like you talk about everything before you talk about the app. Yeah. Um, and because and I think like this is probably like the um, the instinct of a lot of um, content marketers, where it's like let's just provide like 800 words of insight before we even say, hey, by the way, we have an app. Uh, that doesn't work whatsoever because people are not going to stick around and and read what's at the very bottom. Um, but I, I also don't like uh, articles where um, I think it's it's less about it's less about uh, being too salesy, but but, but being uh, too salesy for that headline. So uh, let's say like oh you offer like unless your your headline just says uh, this is everything you need to know about this app, then your your article shouldn't be completely salesy. So you got to provide some other kind of value as well. Um, but you you can be you can do either one actually, as long as you set the expectations right, and you don't talk about your app too late. Uh, so okay. if you, if you want to just go all in and just talk about everything that's great about your app, just make it clear in the headline, because those those poor souls who are clicking on this who are not warned about what, what's coming up, they're going to be pissed and they'll bounce, and that's not good for you. So as long as you prepare everyone for um, for what's about to uh, to come, then that's that's totally fine. You can be salesy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And I think it's what I'm taking away is how important it is to be fully aligned with your entire flow with the headline and the uh, headline of the ad, headline of the article and the article itself. Right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Sandra, what would you say are some of the common mistakes that marketers make when setting up paid content marketing campaigns? Uh, so by paid content marketing campaigns, you mean like Outbrain and Tupula ones? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, there's, uh, where do I start? I think as you can probably tell by the theme of uh, my answer so far, um, I think not coming up with good content is a major mistake. Um, so what I see a lot of um, app marketers doing is that they start these channels thinking that it's very similar to Facebook and uh, Google, for example. And they're just like, okay, we're gonna take the best ads from these platforms and then we're just going to recycle it for Outbrain and Tabula. Um, so like then you end up with a problem where it just the headlines sound like an ad but then you actually you, you're not going to the app store right away you have a landing page and that's only going to cost you um, what I would recommend is that like people just forget about what works on Facebook and Google because they're just entirely different animals sure. and uh, come up with content that would that would uh, be suitable for these channels sure yeah so that would be my first I would say like that's the first thing that First mistake that I, I come across quite a lot. Um, actually, one of the one of the the other issues with um, not coming up with good content is also this thing you mentioned, where people are too afraid of being salesy, and they don't mention their uh, their product until the last step. Um, and actually, it's like it, this happens a lot more than you think. I think out of um, out of all the marketers I talk to, about like maybe two thirds of them make this kind of a mistake. Uh, yeah. where they will, sh they will be like, oh, like, we don't know why our campaigns are so bad. And then I was like, okay, yeah, show me what kind of, uh, what landing page you used. And then I, I read it, I'm just like, where do you talk about your app? I don't, I, like, I've been reading this for like two minutes now. <laughs> I don't see anything about your app. No wonder it didn't work. Yeah. Um, so like, I think it, you shouldn't, just because it, there's content attached to it doesn't mean that you need to like suddenly switch gears and only talk about uh, things that would be suitable for like the economist. You, you just, you gotta, you still gotta sell your product uh, and don't wait too late. Um, also, I think another mistake um, will be like, to, like not looking at the conversions further down the funnel. Um, and like, I know if you were to compare Outbrain and Tabula with Facebook and Google just on cost per install, it's probably not gonna be better. 
but the payoff really comes later on because you're you've you spend a little bit more acquiring these leads who have read more about your product and uh they're probably going to be more likely to purchase or if like let, let's assume that your app is uh, a paid app um these people are probably going to be more likely to purchase and they might even go for the higher package just because they're so convinced they're probably less likely to cancel and more, more likely to renew so the lifetime value is actually higher um but if uh, if you're only looking at like the first metric here which is just installs you're not going to be able to see that and of course like these campaigns wouldn't do that well um but then like like maybe like one month down the road to start revisiting these metrics and see maybe it's actually paying off so you know it's probably not as bad as people think yeah 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 definitely right and uh it's important to just look at your entire funnel holistically uh, just to see your, the downstream impact of all of your marketing. Exactly. Yeah. Sandra, uh, this has been very instructive to me, not just about paid content, but just also about just how to think about marketing holistically. That's uh, great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I really do appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, this is perhaps a good place for us to wrap. Mm -hmm. uh, before we do that, could you tell folks how they can find out more about you and everything you do? Sure. Um, so if you search for me, um, Sandra Wu on LinkedIn, um, or Sandra Wu Blinkist on LinkedIn, um, uh, you can follow me or you can add me. Um, otherwise, I also have a, I have a, a copywriting course at uh, theartofcontentmarketing.com. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you can also get my email address from there as well. So please get in touch if you want to connect. I'd be happy to chat. Wonderful. And we will link to all of that in the show notes. Uh, but for now, Sandra, thank you so much for being on the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Thank really you. appreciate you taking the time. Cool. Thank you for listening to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. If any of this was helpful or instructive, I would love for you to leave us a review or rating on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcast fix. This podcast takes a ton of time, effort, and love to produce, and I deeply value every review and every piece of feedback that you share. Thank you for listening, and I will look forward to sharing our next episode soon.